These are linden blossoms from linden or lime trees in mid to late June you can harvest these and I use them fresh or dried for making linden tea. A linden tea is sold in health food shops and it's really expensive but all it is is these flowers that have been dried. So pick the whole flower cluster including the bract or wing So this wing is what helps the seeds be distributed by the wind. You can dry them in a dehydrator, but if the weather is warm enough and dry, then you can just put them on drying racks and leave them outside or by the windowsill, just for a few days until they go really dry and brittle. Linden tea is the best soporific tea I know of. If I'm having trouble sleeping, I'll make a linden tea and it really does help. Apparently it helps with anxiety and migraines as well. Linden tea has a nice delicate sweet flavour. Linden flowers are a yellowish green colour. They have five petals and five sepals. And they hang in clusters of usually around three or four flowers per cluster and each cluster has one wing or bract. They've got a nice sweet smell. When you walk past a lime tree when it's in bloom, you get a nice sweet honey-like smell from them. The flowers grow in huge numbers on each tree. And because I only take flowers from near the bottom of the tree, there's no danger of overpicking them. This is a very mature lime tree here. It's absolutely huge. So this tree will have tens of thousands of flowers on it. So you can quite happily pick enough from a few different trees to give you a year's supply of linden tea. It's best to pick your linden blossoms on a nice dry day to make them easier to dehydrate. You can also identify lime or linden trees by their heart-shaped leaves that come to a pointed tip. As I said back in May, these leaves are edible, but by this time of year, they're gonna to be too tough to eat. Just a little tip when harvesting, it's actually easier to stand under the tree and pick from the inside of the branches. That way the, most of the flowers are kind of hanging under the leaves. You can find linden trees in woodlands, but it's usually only in ancient woodland. You're much more likely to see them in urban environments, in city parks and along roads. This is annual sea blight, also known as sea spray, an edible member of the amaranth family. It's found all around the coast of the British Isles, in mud flats, mainly in the lower and mid regions of the tidal mud flats. So 
often in the same sort of areas as marsh samphire and it makes a decent marsh samphire substitute. It can grow to around 50 centimetres but it's at its best edible stage at about this size. So it starts as a single vertical stem then as it matures it starts sending off side shoots and it gets quite bushy. So the stems are a greenish colour and they often have a bit of a red tinge. See the little red lines going down the stem there. And the whole plant is completely smooth and hairless. The leaves are half cylindrical in cross section. They're rounded on the bottom and then flat on the top. And the leaves can grow up to around four centimetres on a mature plant. The leaves are a greyish green colour and they are usually pointing upwards. A good identification feature for sea blight is you'll see it has the longer leaves and then in between them growing from the leaf axils are bunches of smaller leaves that look kind of like a bunch of bananas. The plant can start to take on quite a red colour as it matures or in really dry spells. It can be eaten raw or cooked and it has a taste fairly similar to marsh samphire though in my opinion not quite as good. As you can see in June you can get a lot of these shoots of sea blight in the mud flats. It's pretty much like this all the way up for a good few miles of this estuary. This is Fat Hen Canopodium album also known as Goosefoot or Lamb's Quarters. This is a plant that likes to take over cultivated ground. So if you've got any disturbed soil, this plant can quickly take over, which is fine because it's a good native edible. So you're likely to find it around farmers fields and allotments. It looks quite similar to the spear-leaved arak that I talked about last month, and they are quite closely related, but the leaves of fat hen are more oval and they taper at the base. On this slightly more mature plant here you'll see the leaves get narrower the higher up the plant you go. So the leaves are covered in tiny white crystals especially on the underside of the leaf and this is quite a good identification feature because it makes the leaves water resistant. So if you pour water on them, you see it just shoots straight off. So the fat hen greens are at their best at this stage when they're still quite young and they're a good spinach substitute, although I actually think they're a lot better than spinach. And you can see these younger leaves are absolutely covered in those white crystals and they do come off if you rub the leaf. For the more mature plants I prefer the side shoots like this. And also from late June onwards, when the plant starts to flower, you can also pick and eat these and just use them in a similar sort of way to broccoli.
There we go. Bag full of free spinach, collected in a couple of minutes. This is rock samphire. If any of you watched my coastal foraging video back in January, this is the same patch that I filmed back then. You'll see there's a lot more of it now in June. All the way along these rocks. And up here as well. So this is a really good edible that you'll find along cliffs and rocks around the coast. Usually in quite hard to reach places and always above the high tide line. This is another member of the carrot or apiaceae family. As I said before, be very careful with this family. But this is one of the more easy to identify members of that family. It's got quite unique looking leaves and also with the habitat it grows in makes it fairly easy to distinguish from any dangerous members of the carrot family. It's got a flavour somewhere between carrot and aniseed. It's nice eaten raw or cooked. I love it in stir fries quite a lot uh, and it's really good pickled as well. That's probably its best use. So the lighter green growth when it's younger is best but I'll also eat the more mature green leaves and the fleshy stems like this are really nice and the flower heads as well so the leaves are fleshy and succulent and they separate to look a bit like antlers and when crushed they give off a smell similar to carrot, quite a strong carrot smell. Some people say it smells quite petrolly, but I don't get that myself. The flower heads are quite distinctive too. Each flower has five petals, though they haven't quite opened yet. And each small cluster of flowers has bracts behind them, the pointed leaves and each umbel cluster has bracts below them where they join to the stem. Just be careful when harvesting the plant. It's best to use a pair of scissors or a knife to snip the stems because they're quite shallowly rooted into the rock. Rock samphire isn't related to marsh samphire. It's just marsh samphire was used as a replacement for rock samphire back when this used to be a much more popular plant. This is common mallow, Malva sylvestris. This plant likes a lot of sunlight, so look in open spaces like woodland edges, open fields, and along rivers and roads. Their leaves have five lobes, and the leaves are serrated, and they grow on a long petiole and the petioles are hairy. So they have quite distinctive looking flowers which are a light pinky purple colour with darker purple veins. And they have five petals and the petals are notched. And the petals have a gap between them. So 
So the whole plant is quite mucilaginous, so it's quite good. It uses a thickening agent, especially the roots. You can make a extract from the root, which was traditionally used for making marshmallow sweets. The younger leaves are best for eating. They can be eaten raw and they're quite soothing for a sore throat. Or they can be added to soups and stews to help them thicken. The flowers can be used as a garnish or for making tea. But the best part of the plant are the seed pods, often called mallow cheeses because they look like a, a wheel of cheese. They've got a nutty flavour and can be eaten raw or pan fried. The mature brown pods can be roasted and ground to a powder to add to bread. Mallow flowers consecutively through the summer, so you'll find the unopened flower buds and the open flowers and the seed pods all on the same plant at the same time. So yet another use for wild garlic. This time of year the wild garlic leaves have mostly wilted and died back but we can also harvest these, the wild garlic seed pods. These have a lovely strong garlic flavour. They can be eaten raw but they're best pickled or fermented. They're a bit like wild garlic flavoured capers. They go great with roasted Mediterranean vegetables or on a mezze platter. This is yarrow, Achillea millifolium, an edible herb found in most grasslands. It's a member of the daisy or Asteraceae family. It's more used for its medicinal values than its flavour. Yarrow is really good for helping an upset stomach. So if you're feeling sick, just eat some of the leaves raw or make a tea out of the leaves and the flowers and it's also really good for helping to staunch bleeding so directly applying a poultice made out of the leaves to a small cut will really help to stop bleeding it's not really got much of a flavor if I'm making a tea I'll usually mix it with some other herbs like fennel or pineapple weed and you can also make a compound butter with it, a bit like I would with wild garlic. Just really finely chop up the leaves and mix it through butter. Its leaves are very feather-like and you'll see them growing throughout most grasslands. And the stem leaves are a bit smaller and they spiral around the stem. The ones growing throughout the grass from the base of the plant can grow quite long. The flowers are white to pinkish and they grow in quite dense umbels. The flowers can look fairly similar to the umbel clusters from the carrot family but as long as you use them the leaves as an identification feature then you won't get them mixed up. The flowers usually appear from around early June. You can find the basal leaves most of the year round. Sometimes they're a bit small and you have to search through the grass to find them but I prefer to use them fresh so I don't keep any dried. I just go out and pick them as I need them. <laughs> 